I'd like to introduce you to a super athlete. This is Eero Mantaranta. Some of you may have heard of him. He's a Finnish cross-country skier. And he's one, in fact, one of the best Finnish cross-country skiers of all time. He has won seven Olympic medals, three gold, two silver, and two bronze. And yet throughout his career, he was plagued by accusations of blood doping. Now, if you're an athlete, why would you do blood doping? Well, you probably know that your red blood cells are those that carry oxygen to your tissues. And so you might be able to enhance your performance if you had more of those. And so some of our athletes who, who like to cheat will take out some of their red blood cells. They will put them in the fridge, wait till their body makes more red blood cells, and then give themselves their own blood back, changing their hematocrit, the percentage of your blood that is made up by red blood cells from its normal around 55% to a higher number. So the reason that Eero was accused of blood doping is because his hematocrit was around 80%. Instead of, instead of the red blood cells taking up about half, it took up 80%. But in fact, what was found out after a little while was that other members of his family also had a hematocrit around 80%. They were also amazing cross-country skiers. And in fact, over time, what they found was that his family suffered from this condition. He had a mutation in his erythropoietin receptor. So erythropoietin is the hormone that makes your body make red blood cells. He effectively had the accelerator down on his red blood cell manufacturing plant uh, permanently. And this helped his performance unquestionably and also uh, you know, took, took the accusations of blood doping away. Turned out he had a disease, except it didn't really affect him in a negative way, it affected him in a positive way, it helped him win gold medals. He was effectively a superhuman. So do you think these superhumans who are walking amongst us, probably some in this very room, do you think we could find them and characterize them and then use what we learn about them to make the rest of us superhuman? And maybe help those who have disease be normal again? Well, it's actually happened already, might surprise you to learn. There is an aerobics instructor in Dallas, Texas called Charlene Tracy. And the remarkable thing about Charlene is her cholesterol level. Now, you may know your own bl blood cholesterol level if you think about your bad cholesterol. As cardiologists, we try to keep it somewhere around 100 or below. If you've had a heart event, we like to get it even lower than that. Maybe something like 70, 60, 50 would be great. We use medications to do that. We tell you about your lifestyle. We drone on about diet and exercise. Charlene's Resting blood cholesterol was 14. She's effectively a superhuman. Now, what if you could harness what was inside her and then give that to people who had abnormally high cholesterol? And in fact, that's exactly what happened. And just in June of this year, two drugs were approved by the FDA. What she had was a mutation, in fact, in both copies of a gene called PCSK9. And you can think of PCSK9 as kind of the controller of a trash collection agency. And this trash collection agency sends people out every morning to go and collect the bad cholesterol. And the controller, PCSK9, is in charge of calling in those trash collectors from their shift. So if you give a shot, a sedation shot, to the controller and, this, and the controller falls asleep at the wheel, then those trash collectors stay out all day and they, and they keep shoveling the cholesterol and your cholesterol gets lower and lower and lower. And that's what these companies have done. They've taken a human who was a superhuman and made a drug that can make the rest of a superhuman too. In this case, those who suffer from particularly high cholesterol. Well, when we think about athletes, we think about in order to get to the most extreme athlete, everything has to work. You have to be like a finely honed machine. Your heart has to function perfectly. Your lungs have to function well. Oxygen transport systems have to be optimal. Your skeletal muscles have to be extraordinarily fit. So our thought was maybe we could go to the most extreme athletes in the world and study them in intense detail to find new mechanisms and to find new medications. And just to show you how extreme that is, probably most of you in the room will fall under the, the main part of this curve and not in its long tail towards the right. We're looking for people, however, towards the very long tail, actually less than 0 0.001 uh, percent of the population. There are people with gold medals who do not qualify for entry into our study. In fact, this is one you might have heard of. Ryan Lochte has 11 Olympic medals. His reported VO2 max is 70, not high enough to be in our study. Someone who is in our study is this cross-country skier, another one who has one of the highest VO2 maxes ever seen on record, 92 mils per kg per minute. So why are there so many cross-country skiers? Well, you know, athletes always love to, to compare themselves. They always say to me when I'm testing them, who, who am I fitter than? You know, who was, who was last in the lab? Tell me about my VO2 max. Cross-country skiers are right at the top of the who is the fittest of them all uh, table. But if you're going to study them, what are you, you going to do? 
Well, one of the things you can do is look into their genome. And that's a lot of information. Actually, it's six billion data points of information. And I can show you some of it there. The information is a line of ATs, <laughs> Gs, and Cs. You know, and in fact, if you were to stare at this screen uh, that changes at really essentially at once a second, you'd be sitting in this room for three months before you saw your whole genome on the screen here. The rest of my talk is not going to be a, a run through every single screen of the patient's genome. Um, but that's a lot of information, and it used to be expensive information. The Human Genome Project, you've probably heard about that, ran between 1990 and 2001. It was budgeted for $3 billion. So one genome cost $3 billion. In 2015, I can sequence my patient's genome for $1,000. There has not been a technological change like that in medicine or technology that I'm aware of. It, it's, it's absolutely unprecedented. But of course, you're from Stanford, and we want to put that in Silicon Valley units. And the Silicon Valley units are, of course, a Ferrari. <laughs> but if this Ferrari had dropped in cost as much as human genome sequencing had dropped in cost, it would only cost 10 <laughs> cents. <laughs> 10 cent Ferrari for everybody in the room. We will, we'll even throw in some self-driving technology if you want. Although I think if you have a Ferrari, you probably want to drive it yourself. <laughs> 10 cents for a Ferrari, and that's effectively what we're paying now to sequence the human genome. It's cheaper than doing an MRI scan. So what if we took that technology and the most elite athletes in the world and studied them? And so this is the elite study. And the elite study uh, we set up just in the last couple of years at Stanford. And already, even before we have any results, there's been quite a lot of interest among sports publications and, and others. Um, and if what effectively we've done is gone around the world to try and find the, the fittest people in the world. We're currently in 11 countries, 19 different sites. We have about 300 athletes whose genomes we've sequenced, and about 700 in total that are, are kind of on the, on the books ready to be sequenced. I've never talked about the results anywhere in public, but my team this last week were up day and night analyzing the data, knowing that I was going to be standing on this stage in front of you. Um, and we do have actually one of the first results I can tell you about today. Uh, and among our, our athletes, we were looking in particularly for regions of the genome that would be particularly interesting. And we found one. This is one of our athletes in the study, among a number of different athletes that seem to be focused on the thyroid gland. And, and the same gene is involved in, in oxygen uh, adaptation. And so we thought, we've seen that region of the gene. We've seen that gene once before. And this is where we've seen it. This is an Andean Highlander. There are three groups in the world who live above 12,000 feet, in Ethiopia, in Tibet, and in the Andes. And they have adapted. One of the fastest parts of human evolution is how fast they've adapted to living at high altitude. And when we look in these elite athletes, what we found is some changes in the same region of the genome as, as has been seen in these Andean Highlanders that have allowed them to adapt to high to low oxygen levels at high altitudes. And so maybe that's not surprising, but I think what we're really excited about is how we can use that finding, use the knowledge of that gene to go forward to maybe help patients with pulmonary disease, help those who aren't able to make enough red blood cells. And maybe next year I'll be able to come back and tell you about some of the medications that we're developing as a result of the sequencing. Well, if you think you might qualify for the study, there's a website, <laughs> just to let you know. Elite.stanford.edu, or maybe you know someone that might well like to go to sign up. Uh, it's certainly available if you, if you think you're uh, fit enough. Uh, but just in case you're not, and there's a small possibility of that, I offer you these traditionally recognized Scottish athletic events. Um, <laughs> being from Scotland, <laughs> tossing the caber, playing the bagpipes, or perhaps the one we're all uh, qualified for, which is picking up a, a glass of single malt scotch. Uh, I hope to be able to do that with you all at some stage, and uh, thank you for joining us today.